All right, welcome to another edition of the Drew Pearson Show. I'm Drew Pearson, your host for the evening, and we're coming to you live from Henry's Tavern right here at the north side of the Shops of Legacy, just off of Legacy Drive and a toll road, and we're having a great time. What a great place here. A lot of TVs for you sports fans, all kinds of uh, beverages for you to partake in, and a lot going on here at Henry's Tavern. You want to thank them for allowing the Drew Pearson Show to be here once again this evening. We got a great lineup for you tonight. We're going to start off with Mark Colombo and Miss Kelly from ESPN Radio fame. And we're going to talk about that Cowboy loss yesterday, 17 to 16, to the Kansas City Chiefs up there in Arrowhead. And Miss Kelly was actually up there, and she'll give us a report on what that atmosphere was like up there in Arrowhead Stadium, what the Cowboys had to deal with. Also, Paul Southen, he's back in town. He's been up in Toronto. He and Jen Reed have been in the kitchen right here at Henry's Tavern. And, man, they have what they call a nacho bar. And if you haven't seen that or ever heard of a nacho bar, you got to check it out right here at Henry's Tavern because Paul and Jen, they've been relishing in that nacho bar all evening, and we'll find out what they've been doing. Also, Paul, as I said, was in Toronto last week. He's back, and he has a great interview that's going to be part of the Drew Pearson Show with the group Metallica. Wow. So that's part of the Drew Pearson Show. And then we'll wrap things up right here tonight with our social media director, Michael Nask. And if you have a question for me, get in touch with Michael Nask via Facebook or Twitter with your questions, and Michael will be up here later to present those questions to me, and I'll try to answer them for you. We got a great show lined up for you tonight, but none of this could be possible without our sponsors. We want to thank Dodge City of McKinney, Lombardo's Clothier, Albertsons, the food grocer and official grocery store of the Dallas Cowboys. And as a matter of fact, I'll be at Albertsons in Burleson tomorrow night from 4 to 6 signing autographs. So if you're in that area, come on out and catch me and get some autographs. Let's take some pictures and talk some Cowboy football. But you also want to thank Henry's Tavern for their sponsorship and their support of the Drew Pearson Show. It's the only place in the Dallas-Fort Worth Mexiplex that you can get the original 88 burger only here at Henry's Tavern. So the Drew Pearson Show will continue right after this. Stay tuned. All right, we're back on the Drew Pearson Show at Henry's Tavern, where we're about to go through something that sounds so exciting to me, a nacho bar. And we've got David Pena, the executive chef here, who's going to tell us a little bit about your options for nachos. All right, guys. Well, once again, thanks for uh, coming to Henry's. It's, you know, we definitely enjoy having you guys, and uh, we like being the home of the Drew Pearson Show. So uh, this is our, our house-made nacho bar. You pick it, you can make it. So we start out with freshly fried pita chips, our house-made potato chips, and then everybody's favorite, classic tortilla chips. Obviously, they're in a big container for a reason. We also have a nice little crudite vegetables, celery, peppers, carrots. And then we have a nice array of sauces. We've got a Pacifico pepper jack sauce. We actually use Pacifico beer to make it. It's like a white queso. We have our house-made gorgonzola cream sauce. And we have our Texas no bean chili. So you've got your assort assortment of six different cheeses. We've got Marco here cooking up some tequila lime shrimp. We've got four different protein options for you. We have sauteed sausages from Kubi's here in Dallas, our uh, Shiner marinated fajita steak, uh, cilantro lime marinated chicken, and again, the tequila lime shrimp. And then over here is kind of the piece de resistance. We have a straight from Mexico, wonderful, wonderful mocajete, and we make fresh handmade guacamole to order. Then we have all the different garnishes. We have buffalo sour cream, cilantro lime sour cream, and a regular sour cream. And then pickled jalapenos and several different salsas. For $14.95, it's a great option to come in on game days and eat all you want. That's great. So in your opinion, what are the best Henry's nachos? The best Henry's nachos? Uh, basically whatever you want. That's my, my opinion. That's why we do it this way. You can come in and make what you want. You got all the options. 
all the options in the world, as much as you want, fill it up. All right, so if we were to make a play right now with you, what would you get? Well, what I would get, I would get tortilla chips, I would get queso, I would get the shiner brace for heat of meat, I'd definitely go guacamole, definitely go cilantro, lime, sour cream, jalapenos, and then my favorite, the chipotle tomatillo salsa. It'll light you up, but it's great. That sounds perfect. You ready for this? Ready. Let's do it. I All think right. we need to dig into some nachos. Thank you so sounds much good. for being with us. Absolutely. All right. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're at Henry's Tavern right here in Plano, Texas, off the Legacy, right off the toll road, the shops of Legacy. We're on the north side of Legacy Drive, and this is a great place for watching sports and entertainment and having a good time, and that's what we're having right here, the Drew Pearson Show. And, hey, Paul, thank you for that great segment. The nacho bar here at Henry's Tavern is something to see and something to partake in. Anyway, before we get into those nachos, <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> let's talk some Man, I'm football. Hungry, Drew. I'm hungry. Mark Colombo's with us. Give him a hand. All right, former Dallas Cowboy, and also from ESPN Radio fame. Give it up for Miss Kelly Webster. Yeah. All right, Miss Kelly and Mark. First of all, let's get into some sports, and let's, of course, get into Dallas Cowboys. And we'll start with you, Miss Kelly. Your impressions of the Cowboy loss yesterday to the Kansas City Chiefs. I thought it was a tough loss. I think any time you lose by one, and you obviously had several chances to get that win. Uh, so I think it was a little bit surprising. You know, one of the things that I noticed was throughout the week, oh, you know, Kansas City's so good. You heard from the offense and the defense. Oh, they're so good. They're so good. Frankly, after the first half, I wasn't exactly blown away. I really felt like the Cowboys had a chance to pull this one out. So I was pretty disappointed that it didn't happen. Well, before I get to Mark and his impression of the game, you were there at the yep. game. What was that atmosphere like there in Kansas City? Because Watching it on TV, man, it looked like really a great atmosphere to play some football in. Well, it's one of the best venues in the NFL, just pure football fans. And there were some Cowboys fans there, but I'm telling you, it was a sea of red. And when we were on the buses, we're coming into Arrowhead. You're there about three hours before kickoff. As we're pulling into the stadium, as far as the eye could see, that parking lot was full of cars, already tailgating, already ready to go. Such a fun atmosphere. I mean, they were in it from the moment they kicked off. And you know what's interesting is Arrowhead is an older stadium, obviously, right, that right. they did do some renovations to. But on each end zone, there's a tiny oval replay screen that half the time didn't even show a replay. Fans are forced <laughs> to watch the game, understand what's going oh, right on, on, and cheer accordingly. Right so I just thought I would make that point. Mark, uh, did you have a chance <laughs> to play in Arrowhead? I did, Drew. I, I had a, a few chances to play in Arrowhead. So you know how that well, atmosphere is, huh? It's loud. It, it, you know, it has to be great for the home team to get that type of support. It was just one of the most incredible experiences walking into that stadium and hearing the crowd behind their team like that. And, you know, I've had a few good experiences there, most notably Miles Austin in 2009, right. his breakout game. And it was, I would say, in my opinion, the top five games I've ever played in. I played in a lot of football, Drew. Amen. Well, what are your impressions of that Cowboy loss by one point, 17-16? Uh, the Cowboys have to find a way to go into Arrowhead Stadium against the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, I know what the line was in Vegas. I think it was, what, three points, yep. Kansas yeah. City? They're a better team than the Kansas yep. City Chiefs. I think no one will argue that, maybe Las Vegas, but they need to go into a hostile environment like that and pull out this win. There's enough tough games on the schedule where it, it – they just can't do it. They had plenty of opportunities. Um, they, they didn't do a good job running the ball, and I know we'll get into that. Passing the ball, it, Tony Romo seemed like it was a little bit off. And it, it, it's just unacceptable. There was too many penalties. You know, the Cowboys had a few turnovers. I thought they did a really good job defensively, but it, it's just unacceptable. They have to go in. They have to get that game because starting the season 2-0, and it's yeah. a humongous difference, Drew. Big difference. Yeah, they needed that, and there's no question about that. It's the kind of game that later on in the season or down the road, it's the kind of game that you wish you had won because it was, it was there for the taking. They had the opportunities. One thing uh, I noticed in the game, uh, I guess everybody did because we hear a lot about it in everybody's post-game comments, was the lack of the running game or the lack of commitment to the running game throughout the game. I just don't think that 16 run plays versus 42 pass yeah. plays is going to cut it. 
16 rushing plays for 37 total yards. I, all we heard throughout training camp in the off season, a renewed commitment to the run, to making it a success. Uh, DeMarco Murray, Lance Dunbar proved himself a worthy backup from what right. we saw. Yes, he fumbled in the preseason, but he's a nice change of pace back. I like his speed. He's a little bit different than Murray. And yet 16 total plays. Yeah. I just don't think that they're as committed as they say they are. I'm just going on evidence. But uh, they've talked about the need of a run game in order to be successful. And here they are losing by a point without a commitment to the run game. And I know it's tough to run the football in the NFL, but teams are doing it. For instance, Houston last yesterday ran for 170, uh, over 170 yards with Tate and Foster yeah, back, back there. Back, I mean, Tate's a You know why they did that? Because they're committed to the That's running right. game. But can we be committed, Mark, because of the play of the offensive line? Is that holding us back? Well, listen, I, if I'm DeMarco Murray right now, I am a little bit disappointed because I'll tell you what, I'm looking at the first two run plays of this game. I see the first run play. They run a little inside zone to the right, and there's a missed assignment on the right side. The, the right tackle, Doug Free, is supposed to get up on the linebacker. The linebacker shoots through and hits him, I don't know, about five yards deep in the backfield, and DeMarco does everything he can to try and get positive yards, but it's a negative play. First play of the game. They, all week, they're going up against this 3-4 defense. I looked at this play probably 10 times. I kept rewinding and rewinding it, thinking to myself, they got the look that they wanted, they got the play they wanted to the look they wanted, and they still found a way to completely miss a guy. Okay, now I, I take it to the second run play of the game. They try the same thing on the left side. Same thing happens with Travis Frederick. He gets caught up with Don Tari Poe, who had an excellent game. Okay, he gets caught up in a double team, misses his linebacker, right. and DeMarco Murray gets hit in the backfield again. You know, I know there's been a lot of talk about DeMarco Murray this week, but those are the first two plays of the game. Yeah. Your, li your line has to have your back on the first few plays because you're going to lose confidence because now all of a sudden, the first two plays, you have negative, I don't know, three yards running the ball. And what do you do? You're DeMarco Murray. You're thinking, okay, now all we're going to do is pass the ball the rest of the game. It's discouraging. You need to get him more confident. Now, these guys can do it. On the flip side, I see Doug Free. He had probably one of the best games I've ever seen him play in wow. pass protection. He's going up against an unbelievable rusher. And those guys were, were incredible lockdown the whole entire, the whole entire day. And it, was, it, it, it was bad to see on the first play, but he, he turned it around a little bit. But it, it's just it's not good enough. The run game is not there. They have to – I don't know. I don't know if Ryan Waters is the answer. I saw him uh, in a couple drives. He looked pretty good. Um, he just needs to get out there and keep getting some plays and really – emphasis on this run game and really get these guys going yeah. well to get that running game going maybe they needed to pass the ball first because they were throwing it a lot especially in that first quarter and the guy that was getting all the attention this guy that didn't get much attention the week before against the New York Giants and that's Des Bryant the over 100 yards in that first quarter and they were going to him making a conscientious effort to go to him do you think that is the way to go I mean well, beating I our wanted, heads against the wall trying to run the football and, and still, you know, we might have success throwing, especially to Dez. Well, I wanted to ask you, why go away from Dez? Yeah, that why, was surprising. Why did they ever leave him in the first place? What, what were they thinking moving away from him? I don't think the coverage changed, so. It changed a little. Uh, later in the game, they started rolling the coverage, especially on third down. But for the most part, they had that Brandon Flowers covering right. him. And he's like 5'8", five, 5'9", five, exactly. and Dez was eating him up. Yep. And I don't know if Dez got tired or his foot started hurting a little more. Maybe uh, start taking his toll from the routes he was running, from the uh, surface on, uh, out there in Arrowhead. But they did stop going to him, and then they started going to him again. Now he's got to get up to speed right. and try to get back into the flow of things. Well, in the big drop that he had, he totally took responsibility and said, I was so confident it was coming right into my hands and I had already started running down the field and you can't do that and that's not good football. I mean, yeah. I have to say the maturity that he shows as this season continues with how he's responding to a lot of difficult questions is totally impressive. It's so different from what we've seen. He really is understanding it's not about a blame game. I'm not going to put this on anybody else. You can totally blame me for these mistakes. Yeah. And I appreciate that he's doing that. Well, he's living uh, up to, uh, you know, uh, whatever he performs, way, whatever way he performs out there on the field. 
And, you know, he had a great game. He made some he great, great catches game. in there. Yes. But he's got to make that catch yes. in that situation. Agreed. That's the difference when you wear the double eights. It's not so much what you do for the first three quarters. It's what you do in that fourth quarter when a team really needs you. And he, they needed him at that point in the game, and he's got to make that catch. I'm looking at the replay of it, and I said, first thing I say, hey, he took his eyes off the ball. And first thing is comments in post game. Yep. What did he say? I he took, took my his eyes, eyes off, off the ball. The ball. <laughs> and he Des did. He doesn't do that. Des Bryant does no. not drop no. footballs. You talk to anybody on the Cowboys, you talk to anybody in the league, he's got some of the strongest hands, some of the best hands they've ever seen. I, I talk to Jason Witten all the time, and he says Des may be the best pass catcher he's ever seen. This, it just doesn't happen. I, you know, I don't know yeah. if this game just wasn't meant to be, but you know that that type of play doesn't happen. Don't expect too much of that from Des Bryant. Well, you can't have that kind. You can't have that kind of lack of concentration in that situation, and that's all it is. And he's got to step up. And I keep saying he'll learn that, but hey, this is his fourth year in the league. In my opinion, you should know that already. Let's go to the other side of the football, sure. the defensive side. What are your impressions of our defense performance, Miss Kelly? I guess I was a little bit surprised they didn't have any takeaways. Uh, they did rack up four sacks. Right. DeMarcus Ware with two of those, which was great to see. You know, last week, Rod Marinelli taped a cigar on his locker because he was close but no cigar with right. no sacks in week one. Close, a lot of hurries, a lot of hurry-ups, maybe tackle for a loss, but no sacks. So I was thrilled to see him get two. I would love to see him get on track again really cause a lot of disruption. And I know that's based on coverage, you know, who's blocking you and how much attention you're getting. Uh, but I really was impressed with the defense. I thought they made great adjustments as the game went on. Shut down Jamal Charles, except for the last play or the series of last the game. Last drive, yeah. They couldn't get the ball just back. could not. When we needed that ball back. Yes. And I just, but other than, and I know you can say other than that, and that really was the game. That was the changer. I thought they held their own. They earned their paychecks. They did their job in that game, in my opinion. Yeah, if we hold our opponent to 17 points for the rest of the season, I guarantee you <laughs> we're going to win most of those That's football games. Yeah. There's no question about that. But I thought DeMarcus uh, Ware's performance was kind of like uh, Des Bryant's. You know, he had his sacks real early in the football game. Then late in the game when we needed him to step right. up and make a play, he couldn't make that play. Mark, what are your impressions of the defense, and in particular the defensive line, yesterday's game? The defense played winning football. They really did. And even DeMarcus Ware, we talk about that. You know, Andy Reid is a very, very smart football coach, very smart coordinator. He was finding different ways. He was mixing up the plays. Some of the things I want to see out of the Cowboys, he was mixing up formations. He was getting some chips on DeMarcus Ware. He was finding ways to, to attack you know, some of the Cowboys' strengths, particularly late in the game. But defensively, they play winning football. Special teams, Orlando Skandrick gets a block. Uh, uh, you know, that, I mean, are you kidding me? He's that, my height. That's really <laughs> tough to do. Some teams go a whole season without a block. Right. Here we are in week two with the field goal block. That's big time. That is big. And, and, you know, and, and, and offensively, I think the game was lost offensively. I you know, it, it, the numbers, they need to put up more numbers. And if you're going to rely on the pass, you better be good at it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it takes a total team effort to win nowadays in the National Football League. You need offense, defense, special teams all stepping up. You mentioned special teams. Their performance so far this season is tremendous improvement from what we saw last year from our special teams. The return game, the coverage game, the block kicks. And what about Dan, oh, Dan Bailey? Bailey? Oh, my God. He is Mr. Automatic. He's so gold. And the thing about that, we're relying on that, you know. You get kick a 53-yard field goal, a 51. You have the ability within your, your offense to have that there. Man, that's a big plus for the Cowboys. So the special teams and the defense really stepped up. The offense needed to be on par with them, and they really weren't. And I wanted to ask you if, if I, I guess toward the end of the game when Tony Romo was really throwing some errant passes that w were not even that close, I'm just curious if you feel like he might be more injured than they're letting on. Maybe the pain shot wore off. His ribs may have been bothering him more. But those passes, even from the press box high up, we had a good angle. They were nowhere near those receivers. Yeah, he was uh, a little off late in the game. But let me tell you something. He threw some beautiful passes, yeah. man. Those passes he was throwing at Dez uh, were just a thing of beauty. He has a tremendous accuracy and a tremendous feel. And you're probably right. He probably that 
shot wore off. He got hit a little, nicked a little. And as the game wore on, you know, it started to bother him and affect him a little more. But still, he had a nice, efficient game. He didn't throw any interceptions or anything like that. And it seems like now when he comes to the line of scrimmage, he's more in charge and, more, and making more adjustments and audibles and changing plays and things like that because, you know, he's nine years now in there as a starter. And, you know, he's recognizing things. Right. And he's like a coach on the field. And I bet half of the plays that Callahan call, especially in the passing game, Romo changed those because he was seeing things different from what they were seeing right. in the booth. And that's good because he's now into the game. Yeah, let's, I mean, let's, let's not throw in the towel on this season just yet. Oh, no. You know, I, this is, I, I heard so much talk today. I mean, Guardians about poker. this game. I mean, it's it's a it's one and no, one. You go into a fight. tough environment and you lose a close football game. The Cowboys. I like what I've seen. I like what I've seen from Callahan's offense. I really like what I've seen from Monty Kiffin's defense. And now special teams. You got guys like Dwayne Harris are just unbelievable. Right. I am not worried. I think the Cowboys are going to take care of business this week, and it's going to be a good season. Let's not throw in the towel just yet, Cowboys fans. No, not not at all. But you mentioned St. Louis. That's who we got next week at uh, AT and T Stadium. Your impressions of that one? I, I agree with Mark. I feel like uh, I, I feel like. I, based on no evidence whatsoever, I do feel like they're going to get back to the run and they're going to see what they can do with it against this Rams team, which is a very good opportunity to do so. I, I'm not saying the Rams are the worst team in the league, but this is a good opportunity to really try some things and make a commitment to the run game and see what they can do offensively. Mark, you think they can bounce back next week? Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting a strong offensive rushing attack next week. You know, DeMarco Murray has a really good history against the St. Louis Rams, one of probably his best game he's ever played a few years ago. I expect them to rely on him and really just quiet people about this rushing attack. Yeah, it's going to be a tough game. They, one, they need to win, but hopefully they don't take these guys lightly because the St. Louis Rams, they bring it too, just like everybody does in the National Football League. But anyway, we're having fun here at Henry's Tavern. That's our sports talk with Mark Colombo and Miss Kelly Webster. And the Drew Pearson Show from Henry's Tavern will continue after this. We'll be back with more sports and entertainment here at Henry's Tavern, only on the Drew Pearson Show. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. I'm joined on the set by Paul Salfin, our entertainment and food guru, and also Jen Reed, our entertainment and food guru as well. Before we get into an entertainment segment, let's talk a little bit about that nacho bar and uh, how was that experience there? Oh, man, I could talk about that nacho bar all night long. You know, any place that has a little torch that can torch your cheese and melt right. it, okay with me. <laughs> right. It's all kinds did you, of... Did it you enjoy amazing. it? amazing. Yes, it was absolutely amazing. So what's the deal? You, like, just make your own nachos? What did you guys cook up? Make your own nachos. I put my own spices to it. And it's kind of amazing. I, you know, it's... Let me ask you, do you like jalapenos? Did you put jalapenos, any on Jalapenos, the spicier the possible. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> right on. Only in Texas, right? Exactly. Or only at Henry's yes. Tavern can you find yeah. a nacho bar, right? Yeah. You just go through the line, get your chips, get your cheese, get your meat, and all the toppings you could ever imagine, even ones you probably couldn't imagine, and just have a feast. Well, and in fact, I'm going back for more. We are. <laughs> I'm going to follow you. Good job with that segment. Thank you. Last week you weren't here. Jen and I had said you were in Toronto, and we told our listening audience where the great Paul Salfin is now. We're trying to follow you on Twitter and everywhere else. But you were in Toronto, and tell us about some of your experiences up there. I was. I was having a great time. I was at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it was just such an amazing experience. Uh, I was with a group called Origin Releasing, checking out all these great films that they're purchasing. And right now, uh, I also got to sneak off and do some interviews for us. We, I was there, uh, in fact, this next segment is uh, an interview with Metallica's drummer, Lars Ulrich, as well as Dane DeHaan, who's the star wow. of Metallica Through the Never, the concert film. But also, in coming weeks, we're going to have interviews with Matthew McConaughey, Jared Leto, Jennifer Garner, and a whole bunch more. Wow, so you and Jen are going to be pretty busy, huh? <laughs> I think we are. <laughs> My favorite band, so. Yeah. All right, let's find out and take a look at what Paul was doing in Toronto and his experience with Metallica.
My whole life I've been waiting for that moment When it all starts to make sense We got a truck that's out of gas in the city, you gotta find it And we got something that the band needs tonight, okay? So get him back and you know what to do Another night, another show I do what they tell me I go where they send me But sometimes the moment that changes everything is the one you never see coming. ago in uh, Belfast and, uh, and and had a chat about what could we do with this experience that would be different and unique, take it somewhere else and how could we create a, you know, what we constantly try to do for our fans and, and for ourselves is to uh, just, you know, create different metallic experiences and different, you know, undertakings and what do we do that's different? And so um, the idea of this film had been sort of floating around for the better part of 15 years actually and um, so getting a chance to do it now and, and you know the main thing that we did I think was just treat the whole thing like a film shoot uh, we created the stage for the film and everything about the film shoot you know was sort of it was a controlled environment rather than having 20,000 people in a, in a concert environment so it, it just was contained in a different way and we just we're proud of the fact that people seem to re be reacting to it so well Right. And Dana, this is different for you. You didn't get to say very much, did you? No, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, it was a one-of-a-kind uh, and I think undeniably cool uh, project to get to work on and definitely one of the challenges of it artistically was not having any lines and, uh, you know, going through this journey uh, and not saying anything and uh, the challenge of doing that and hopefully... Uh, still doing it believably enough that the audience goes along for the ride with me. Yeah, have you been a Metallica fan for years? Well, like, honestly, not for years. Um, I, I really started to listen to them a lot um, while I was making Place Beyond the Pines because uh, I was decided that my character would like to listen to it, and I gained an appreciation for it then, and then you know, I got this call to do this project and it just seemed way too cool. And um, and then, you know, that was the first time I had seen them in concert and seeing the show uh, four nights in a row and seeing the band and getting to know the band and the fans and, you know, the, the release that they give so many people and the amazing show they put on. Uh, you know, I definitely left the experience a huge fan. Yeah. So how cool is this then? You get to, to do all this. It's pretty cool, you know. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, it's great. And it's and a two way street, by the way. So, oh yeah, yeah. exactly. Trust well, I mean, me. I you you've seen his work, and so was, was that part? Of, did you have him in mind after seeing? Um, well, when we when we partnered up with Nimrod and and he created the character of Trip, uh, I was. Um, I can't remember where I was, but I got a phone call from one of our producers saying that Dane DeHaan was available, and I was—I called everybody and just said, whatever happens, we have to get him. I'd seen him uh, in Chronicle uh, with my kids, not yeah. knowing anything, uh, then catching up on in treatment, and then subsequently saw him, in, obviously, in uh, Lawless and Lincoln uh, that fall, uh, and then obviously after we did our experience with Pines and all the rest of it, but it, you know, Dane just has something different. And 
you know, when there are a lot of very competent actors out there in their early to mid 20s, but when I saw Chronicle, I literally, I mean, I'm not just saying this, I walked out of the theater and IMD beat him. Yeah. And because he was so, there was something about the face that was so magnetic. Um, and when we're doing, when we're doing all the, the first probably five cuts of this film, we're sitting with our director, we're just sitting, put more of Dane in, yeah. put more Dane in, less of the band members, more Dane, and ultimately we actually ended up um, doing reshoots hmm. because we wanted more Dane in, and he was tied up with um, some small spider something film, and um, so it was difficult to get him, but yeah. we got him just enough to, to get a little more Dane, thankfully. Oh, that's great. I think it's the only film I've done where everything we shot Every made single it in yeah, there movie are no, and yeah. more. <laughs> there know? are no DVD extras. Yeah, there are no <laughs> DVD extras. <laughs> it's just that good. <laughs> well, the show is the Drew Pearson Show, and Drew famously caught the Hail Mary pass. And uh, I think everyone has a Hail Mary moment in their life where they just had to go for it and didn't think it was going to work out, but it did. What do you suppose that was in your careers? I, I don't know. I, I When I think of Metallica's career, I always think that we have a lot of those. I mean, we just go for it. Yeah. Way too often, I sit there afterwards and go like, "What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Uh, what were we thinking?" But we, for a band that's been around as long as I'm, we have, I'm proud of the fact that we're still as as impulsive as as we are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my career is pretty young, uh, <laughs> but I guess if I had like a real go for it, hail mary kind of moment, it was probably when I moved to L.A. Yeah. You know, I left New York and. I had kind of this whole really wonderful theater community behind me, and, uh, and but I moved to L.A. in pursuit of getting into films, and uh, it could have gone either way, but uh, I think I I think I caught the pass. So. Perfect. Touchdown. Well, I like it. Yeah. Well, last thing, we're here in Toronto for the Toronto Film Festival, and there's so much great stuff to do here. Are you going to get to see any other films or do anything else while you're here? I've actually uh, informed the wonderful people that work for us that I'm going to see a film every night for my own sanity because if I'm going to do um, all this press and yeah. hear myself talk all day, uh, then I need to at least have a couple hours of Lars time. I saw uh, 12 Years a Slave last night, right. which just completely blew my mind, and I'm going to see Labor Day uh, tonight. Great. Labor Day tonight. And uh, so I'm, I'm getting a little bit of, of, of Lars time. That's great. I get some Dane time. Uh, well, <laughs> um, I have three movies here, yeah. so there's no Dane time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna watch all of my movies um, and talk about all of my movies. I'm not gonna drag him to Labor Day tonight. <laughs> he just doesn't know it yet. Well, hopefully, you don't get too tired of talking about yourselves. Thank right. you so much for being with us. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, thank you. Nice talking. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Wow, man, how cool was it to hang out with the guys from Metallica? Even a brother like me. Knows Metallica, man, that must have been cool, huh? Absolutely. You know, I actually grew up listening to Metallica, so it was it was an honor to to be there. And and I've interviewed so many people, you know this, but when you actually sit down with someone that you grew up listening to, it's a special moment. So it was really cool. And I know that Jen's a big fan, and Mark Colombo's a big fan. Absolutely. So this, uh, yeah. So All this right. is a great uh, great segment for the show. And uh, I just found out also we're going to go to Fantastic Fest, check out the film again, and maybe talk to a couple other of the members. Wow. Well, you keep bringing us great interviews like that. We appreciate the entertainment segment right here in Drew Pearson Show. And from Henry's Tavern, we'll have more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this. Hi, this is Paul Southman from the Drew Pearson Show, and we're here at Henry's Tavern in Plano, Texas for Dodge City of McKinney, who provided us with the wonderful 2013 Dodge Dart GT. Now check out this exterior. This is the Tungsten Metallic. This one has the 2.4 liter Tiger Shark engine with multi-air technology and active grill shutters. There's also the six-speed Powertech automatic transmission. And then there's the sports tune performance suspension with frequency dampening shocks for better handling. Check out the dual rear bright exhaust. Then we've got the 18 inch by seven and a half inch hyper black aluminum wheels. And the LED racetrack tail lamps. Now check out this interior. We've got heated Napa leather seats, black with red stitching, and leather wrapped heated steering wheel with audio controls and paddle shifters so you never have to take your hands off the wheel. Class exclusive passenger in-seat storage. One of my favorite features is the Uconnect. It's an 8.4 inch touchscreen with the iPod control and backup camera. So you can see what's going on behind you. 
And then we've got the seven inch TFT screen in the gauge cluster. And best of all, you can get all of this for less than $25,000. This is the 2013 Dodge Dart GT from Dodge City of McKinney. All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're coming to you tonight from Henry's Tavern right here in Plano on the uh, north side of Legacy Drive at the Shops of Legacy. And what a cool place. And we've had a great time here tonight. We're down to our final segment of the Drew Pearson Show. And as I say every week, my favorite segment because I get to talk to you via Twitter, via Facebook, and my man, our social media director, Michael Nass, He's been taking your questions all night long, and he's come up with a few good ones that he's going to try to stump me on tonight. Yes. What do you got for me, Mike? In, t in tonight's episode of Just Ask Drew, Heidi, who is one Texas cowgirl on Twitter, asked if Landry was in charge today, who would he replace and who would he replace them with? On the Cowboys roster? Oh, or man. coaches? Anything. Oh, coaches. There'd be some coaching replacements. I think, first of all, Coach Landry would take over the play-calling duty on offense because despite him being a defensive coach, uh, mostly in his career, he uh, did a pretty good job of handling our offense when I was playing. We averaged almost 28 points a game throughout my career. So he'd be a very good offensive coach. So he would probably take over the play-calling duty. But some of those players that aren't performing up to par, like offensive linemen or defensive linemen, there's no question their jobs would be in jeopardy. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jimmy P. on Twitter asks, why do so many coaches throw a third down pass that's way too short of the yard yardage needed, especially the Cowboys? Yeah, good question, Jimmy P., because that frustrates me more than anything. At least get enough to get the first down. But you know what, Michael? A lot of it is not the coaches. The coach will call that play. But the receiver's got to be smart enough to run that route to the distance it takes to get the first down. If it's five yards, you run that route to seven because you might have to come to the f back to the football to five yards to make the catch and get the first down. So a lot of it not necessarily on the coaches, but on the receivers, the players, to get the right distance for the first down to make that catch. All right. Uh, one other question here is uh, three field goals yesterday has just been an, an epic trend for the Cowboys not being able to convert in the red zone. What, what is the root problem of why they can't convert and they're kicking so many field goals? Yeah, they got to get a little creative when they get closer to the goal line and come up with some special plays to take advantage of the talents of Des Bryant, Miles Austin, Jason Witten, even Dwayne Harris and Terrence Williams. And I, I don't like what I've been seeing in the play calling in that situation. It's too conservative there because they know they have Mr. Automatic, Dan Bailey, right there, you know, and they know they can get at least three points in a lot of situations. But you can't rely on 51-yard field goals, 53-yard field goals, which Bailey hit uh, in yesterday's game. You can't rely on that. So they got to come up with more creative ways to get to the ball, get that football to their playmakers in that red zone area. All right, and final question. Uh, like I said, we let all fans ask you questions, but uh, Sylvester at, on Twitter asks, why does the NFL allow refs to decide more games than the players on the field? <laughs> well, I don't know if you want to touch that one. <laughs> I, I don't care. I hated those refs back in the day. But Sylvester, hey. The refs are a big part of the football game. They try to do the best they can. A lot of their calls are scrutinized because we have this instant replay and all that. And of course, a lot of those calls sometimes are overturned in certain situations. But the refs are part of the game. You gotta live, you gotta die with their calls. And hopefully for the Cowboys, we'll do a lot of living with the calls that the refs make this year. That all you got for me? That's all we got. Make sure you follow the Drew Pearson Show on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Google+. Plus. All right, our social media director, Michael Nass. And that pretty much wraps up the Drew Pearson Show for another week. We're coming to you live from Henry's Tavern. We've had a great time here the Nacho Ball Bar. <laughs> all those great things that we experienced right here at Henry's Tavern. And we will see you next week right back here 
for more of the Drew Pearson Show. Thank you for watching.